are you afraid to call and talk to your parents? I know if my mom lived in the equivalent of modern day Nazi controlled area, I don't know if I would be like, hey, let me see what's going on. I mean, I'd be, I would miss my mom, but I just wouldn't want to attract attention. I lost contact with my parents for about three years. Oh, wow. Before May 2020. After Speaker Pelosi appointed me to serve at the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, it's a voluntary government uh, uh, work, I uh, called my mom, uh, knowing that the Chinese will listen. I told her the news uh, because I don't want somebody else to come to tell, tell the news. So since then, I've been able to communicate. Uh, but this is not the case for vast majority of our fellow Americans and citizens of Europe and others uh, in the Uyghur diaspora. Because, again, go back to IJOP. In addition to IJOP, the Chinese have a mobile data scan machines, uh, cyber police, uh, omnipresence everywhere. So if you have contact, like a call history, text messages, voice messages with your foreign contact, uh, specifically if you have a WeChat on your phone, the government monitor your phone calls, your activities real time. There's nothing like WeChat in the world today. It's a combination of Amazon, eBay, uh, your um, PayPal, uh, anything, uh, WhatsApp. It's, it's a combination of uh, many, many things. So each and every one of the phones, handheld devices in China, uh, it's not must, but have this app that itself let the government to monitor you so because of that because of the random data scan on the streets compel the Uyghurs to tell their family members around the world not to contact them oh wow I so I was one of, and my parents told me not to contact because if they find the traces this is so dramatic in 2000 uh, during the period of 2017 and 19 so a lot of people end up being in the camp because of the caches on their phone, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, phone call records, uh, call histories. So there are still, um, it is still the case with the vast majority of the Uyghur diaspora. Thank God, because of my U.S. government official status, and knock on the wood, I've been able to communicate. Yeah, I was even able to see my father's face uh, through a video call when he passed away mm. in April th on April 3rd. It's the amount of insane, oppressive 1984-style control and repression is really next level. I've just never heard anything like this in my life. You say they scan, they do a data scan. I, I assume what you mean is they could, the police can just look at your phone at any time using some kind of machine, and they're going to look at all your texts and calls yeah. just walking around. It, yeah, this is Googleable information. If you just uh, Google uh, some search terms, you will actually pull up the Uyghur individuals dreadfully handing their phone in to uh, cyber police, letting them uh, scan their phones. Um, it, and also, as I describe in the book, uh, because of this intrusive surveillance techniques that could result you into a concentration camp, some Uyghurs try to use the dumb phone, and then the authorities come, what are you trying to hide from mm -hmm. us? So right. even you... <laughs> So you can't. So either way, uh, uh, it's it's cash twenty two uh, situation for the individual. So they made a decision. Okay, I, if I don't see my children in this world, if I don't talk to my children in this war, uh, the Uyghurs being a deeply religious, they said, okay, we'll meet life after. So sad. Surely this didn't happen overnight. Can you tell me about how this transformation of Xinjiang happened? I mean, I assumed you kind of saw. Hey, this business closed that sold religious books. Wow, that person just vanished. It, it, this seems to be like a. It, it can't. It couldn't have just happened overnight. Sure, the the mass arrest, the ten, uh, the seventeen thousand people in ten days, that was a big jump. But I assume this started as a slow boil. So, um, Jordan, this requires a little bit of a China politics discussion, okay. uh, if I may. Um, sure. I will give you a little bit of um, a background. This is um, this did not start overnight, and this was not something that um, a Chinese leader or leaders got up on the wrong side of the bed, decided to uh, 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 commit acts of genocide. This has been in the works for a long time. This goes back to 2009 when uh, the Uyghur uh, 
uh, youth took to the street to protest in uh, Uyghur capital, Urumqi. Uh, resulting from this toy factory in Guangdong beating up uh, the Uyghurs enslaved in the toy factory and killed uh, and injured. So that was the beginning. That was the trigger. So essentially the Chinese leadership says or told themselves or promised, we can't tolerate this anymore. We used to uh, uh, allow the Uyghurs uh, a life uh, and manage them with carrot and stick. Uh, we allowed them to uh, become wealthy, uh, build businesses, travel outside the country. Can't do that anymore. So starting 2009, 2012, and 13 was a kind of a transition period. And also we cannot miss mentioning the supreme leader, Xi Jinping, uh, come to power. He came to power in 2012. So in 2013, uh, Xi Jinping uh, published a speech. It's called the Number 9 Document. That Number 9 Document essentially... Uh, it promoted something called management of ideological battle, battlefield. It, if you look at the Chinese wording, it's very powerful. Even uh, when Xi Jinping is warning Biden about Nancy Pelosi's trip, Speaker Pelosi's trip to Taiwan, he used that very uh, a, uh, a profound word that could be interpreted in many ways. So Xi Jinping wants to management of the ideological battlefield. So with that, he come up with something, essentially, uh, you know, from all the way from Deng Xiaoping to Xi Jinping, hide your strengths and bide your time. So in that concept, so what the Xi Jinping regime did was, okay, these people will not going to be able to uh, have the life of the Uyghurs or practice their religion. As long as they maintain this lifestyle, as long as they, they maintain this religious practices, it will be ideological threat to communist ideology. And it will be impossible to manage. And also, this is a sign of disloyalty. We, we don't allow Western religion, foreign religion, namely Christianity and Islam, because it comes with the Western ideology. And it's attracting, it's attracting to the uh, Chinese population, attracted to that Western influence. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? A, we need to do synthesization of religion, rewriting the textbook, Bible, Quran, uh, main target. This is why they're targeting the Catholics in China today as we speak. They're removing the cross from the uh, church. Uh, they're also displaying Xi Jinping's pictures. Wow, so creepy. And, 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 and then also forcing the Christian leaders, Muslim leaders, to preach Xi Jinping and promote Xi Jinping ideology in the places of worship. It's sickening. Xi Jinping ideology is not a religion. So, so, so that's what they... And then also, finally, they see Xi Jinping regime, CCPC's religion and ethno-identity, ethno-religious identity, would play a source of future instability. What could be the reason for political upheaval. So in order to get rid of it, starting 2014-15, Xi Jinping asked his policy advisors, I described this in the book, to come up, the, come up with a plan. They come up with a plan called uh, uh, final solution to the Xinjiang problem. I mean, that they sounds didn't... like as Nazi as it gets. Yeah, it does not say the Uyghur problem, but the Xinjiang problem. Mm -hmm. They reference it, it, it. They're very skillful. You know, they're very careful with their language. And also they come up with a, a, a series of uh, policy documents. And then in 2015, Xi Jinping thought, OK, this is a great idea. So who do I enforce this? And pick the guy that I was mentioning earlier. So this is all this. This whole thing is a Xi Jinping's project, Xi Jinping's pet project. He wants to have. Uh, fully controlled Xinjiang region so that his Belt and Road Initiative, his global uh, 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 global ambition, China dream, would have no obstacle. But the pushback is this. Xi Jinping already securitized this region. You know, former ambassador, uh, deputy ambassador to UN, Kelly Curry, often says Xinjiang and Tibet are the two secure places, most safest places on the on the face of the earth because of that heavy political pre, uh, police presence. 
There's almost this social crisis is almost non-existence, Jordan. This is all like what they're dealing with the political crimes, quote unquote political crimes. The social crime, like you know, they used to have a, uh, thieves, you know, the the murder, uh, the traffic accidents, the the drug, they're all gone. He didn't have to commit a genocide, but this brutal regime chose this method to a to to make it legitimate, legitimize Xi Jinping's rule because domestic audience, the Chinese historically reward strong leader, mm -hmm. loathe weak leader. He wants to show that he's doing something to secure stability at any cost. And then two, he wants to show to the world that he cannot tolerate political dissent. And then three, he wants to have a safe pathway to Eurasia market and the global influence operations that is coercive, corrupt, and uh, corrosive, as described by uh, Australian uh, policy expert John Garno. So this is about China's future ambition. This is why I genuinely believe, uh, as I made the case in the book, and as I've been saying in public, anyone treats the Uyghur genocide as another human rights catastrophe or crisis are mistaken. This is on us. Because China is doing this to achieve a broader uh, political objective, uh, realize China dream, uh, achieve, uh, you know, essentially wanted to take over. And there is a Chinese proverb called Ni si wo huo, uh, you die, I live. So some, some of our politicians in Washington mistakenly put out this idea of coexistence. It does not exist. It's a zero-sum game for the Chinese. And they have tested that in Xinjiang. No one raised a finger, except for the United States for the most part. Destroy Hong Kong democracy, it's gone. And posing daily threat against Taiwan, we're still dancing, tiptoeing around, uh, chanting slogans that we're not against Taiwanese independence. Uh, we, want, we don't do this, we don't do that. It sounds like surrender even before somebody's challenging you. It's, it's, uh, it does not bode well. I mean, I'm, as we speak, Nancy Pelosi is pissing off all of the Chinese diplomatic corps by landing in Taiwan, which is good. I don't think we should back down from bullies. I don't think ba backing down from bullies, especially authoritarian states like that, has ever done anybody any good. Um, I want to talk about the phone thing real quick, because we didn't sort of finish that point there. The, the police are scanning your phones, but I've heard from people with connections on the ground in China that you have to take your phone with you everywhere. And you mentioned dumb phones. iPhones are banned because the the police install this app on your phone called it's something like Internet Soldier or something yeah. like this. And all of your location data, your communications are logged. AI searches through it. They look for religious words and phrases, among other things. And you can't even say Salam Aleikum, which is an Islamic greeting to your friend right. on the phone, because they will pick that up and say, ah, you're a potential extremist. I mean, that kind of infraction can land you in in a concentration camp and and it's just the the, the amount of just the things of the everything that we're talking about right now by the way is 10 times worse and more detailed in the book right the flag raising ceremony where you have to go your attendance is monitored they ban new items and behavior in books they tell you what these are at this flag it's it's like if you had to go to a pledge of allegiance ceremony and then they said okay you can't speak spanish anymore you can't celebrate christmas you can't go to church the Bible is forbidden. If you have one, you're going to go to prison. Uh, it's just the most dystopian stuff you've ever heard, you've ever read. It's like East German Stasi, but with more invasive technology. Exactly, exactly. I And also, uh, as you pointed out in the book, I also uh, interviewed um, uh, uh, the genocide survivors, uh, female genocide survivors, camp survivors. And the common theme that I heard from them is during the interrogation, uh, it is so unbearable. unbearable. Uh, 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 Mihri Gultursun, the youngest of uh, those camp survivors, even begged the, the, the guards to kill her because she could not tolerate that torture, psychological, physical, even seeing the others being tortured. And also on top of that, this, the, the psychological torture, condemning your own God, you know, just let this sink in if you're just a devout Jewish uh, uh, believer or, uh, at all, or a Christian practitioner or Christian individual. And some government comes to make you to condemn your God. 
that can break your mental health. <laughs> that could break you. So in, in one of the uh, uh, interviewees, the uh, camp survivors told me that they have to chant slogans such as, who was your God? A new God, Xi Jinping. Ugh. And then they have to study the Xi Jinping thoughts as if that's a, the kind of a new religious textbook <laughs> day in, day out. Um, so it is, it is um, sometimes when you talk about these things, it sounds so unreal because it's hard to even fathom that this is even happening. And, and the disturbing aspect is that while this is all happening, we try to normalize this behavior, either to, looking, either to look the other way, feigning ignorance, or entrapped in economic interest. So, so it begs the question, like, what kind of future do we really want? Are we this become, when did we become this little that we just let the regime... Uh, a Chinese regime, Communist Party, to do this against our values, against our will, against our historical promises, never again. In 1945, um, um, American prosecutor uh, Robert Jackson said at the Nuremberg trials, never again. That never again promise has been <laughs> yeah. miserably failed. We've been like breaking, I just took part of a uh, a documentary. Uh, the name of the document is called "Broken Promise." The broken promise is essentially on the idea about why we keep seeing the genocide after the Holocaust. We promise never again. Mm -hmm. So what happened to the it, it, that promise? That valve rings shallow, hollow today because of tepid and meandering responses that uh, we're seeing in response to the Chinese genocide. It, this genocide will not end within China because China has its cohorts, uh, countries like Iran, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and some African countries, some Latin American countries. Their league of uh, human rights abusers are growing. So their model will be replicated in the political repression, surveillance. So in the end, in some countries, even voting records will be sub, uh, surveilled, monitored, even some instances brought consequences to people who did not vote to a certain individual. And it, 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 86 countries already adopted a Chinese surveillance techniques. So this thing is metastasizing. Yeah, they're exporting a lot of their surveillance technology and techniques to despotic regimes around the world. That's probably that's probably a whole nother show. But yeah, I mean, th this is one of the reasons that the United States and other countries didn't want Huawei to run 5G globally, because they were going to be using that for surveillance and funneling the information back to China and into their AI machines. And I, I mean, it's just absolutely wild. My university, the University of Michigan, actually got rid of some, or did not renew the agreement with something called the Confucius Institute, which it originally was just like, let's teach Chinese dancing and culture and language to people in other countries, and then had started to become, hey, Chinese student at a democracy rally, I'm going to take your photograph, and not, then I'm going to email it to you and say, here's you at a democracy rally. Don't your, fa don't, don't your parents still live in a suburb of Shanghai? You should probably be careful about the kind of clubs you go to, because in the the way this happened was pure mafia. Uh, this is firsthand, or I should say secondhand, but I heard it from the person it happened to. They would say, "I went to a rally that was a talk. It was like Ai Weiwei or some artist, you know, Chinese dissident giving a talk." And they'd say, "My grandmother and my father called me and said, stop going to political events in the United States and focus on school.'" And it's like. How did they know I was there? Well, somebody from the Confucius Institute or or some or pretending to be from there went there, took the names and photos of every student that was there, kicked that to the police in China who called the family to the police station and said, warn your kid at the University of Michigan or Stanford or wherever the example happens to be and tell them to stop being political. Yeah. And if they're going to be political, be pro China. That stuff was happening in the is happening in the United States. And it's just it's a huge concern of mine. One, I'm anti CCP in the first place. Right. Communist Party because of things like this. But I'm very pro Chinese in human rights because my wife's family is from Taiwan. This whole thing is is crazy to me. Monitoring political speech in the United States and using your family against 
in the homeland against you is just so mafia. I don't even know what would be more gangster in a bad way than that. It's beyond. I mean, it 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 is mafia. We can't say it any better than that. There's some amazing cases coming out uh, from the FBI. Uh, the Department of Justice uh, put out some indictments recently where we have private eyes. These are guys that used to work for the cops in Boston or New York. Uh, in some cases, we, we had a cop. That we, he was a New York cop, again, used by the Chinese consulate to spy on diaspora community there. But we, we're talking about networks here. So you're right, the Confucius Institute, people taking names, people taking photos, that information being shared. So again, uh, you're right. They call family back home. They'll bring the family into the police station in China and get yeah. a video call going with that person, whether they are in Australia or the United States. And uh, what I really want to stress is uh, mafia. Yes, the latest DOJ cases we see that we've got a guy from the Ministry of Public Security or the MSS, State Security. They're both uh, foreign intelligence agencies used by the CIA. Is that like a Chinese FBI? Like, what, what is so that? So the equivalent? MSS would be like the CIA, and the uh, the Ministry of Public Security would be the FBI. They've got a, they're basically in charge of all national security and, and police matters, serious crime in China, but they also have uh, a counter espionage and a foreign espionage function. So we're finding that they'll send these officials over, they'll, they'll put them in a liaison, uh, you know, whether it's in Houston, New York, Toronto, Vancouver, and they go out in the community and they'll make relationships with people at these, um, what they call compatriot society or United Front dinners, where uh, all the community will meet politicians of all stripes and colors but what's going on while they're all you know having a bun toss and uh, you know having some wine they're recruiting so you'll get this uh, police agent from china he's uh, gonna recruit the gangster who's there who might not look like a gangster he may look like a tycoon a real estate developer he might he may like to go to the casinos in boston or vancouver but this is all sort of police intelligence activity. They will recruit uh, Western private eyes to be involved in their schemes of going after whether it's, you know, young people at university who want to speak out against uh, harms in Xinjiang, or they'll be going against uh, the economic, uh, the, the wealthy people that may have fled China, uh, rightly or wrongly, with a lot of money stolen, maybe some legitimate money, but they're a target of the CCP. And uh, this police agent will use anyone at his disposal, whether they're a Western citizen or, uh, you know, a diaspora community member who's in the gangs. Hey, I did a, a, a little bit with Lao Wai 86 off YouTube. We talked a little bit about how there's YouTubers being recruited for this. So there's these, we call them like white monkey jobs. Uh, but there's there's guys from the UK, United States, Canada, whatever that maybe they live in China, maybe they live here and they'll accept a few hundred bucks and they'll do these videos that's like, oh, all this stuff you heard about China is false. Here's the real deal. And it's like CCP talking points that they got that and, and Lao Wai has documents that's like it's copied from Chinese state media emailed to them. And then the, an ad agency is like, we'll give you 600 bucks to do a video yeah. about this. And it's just, they're just not do it in they're a, pretending in a nice that they British dug up accent, the, <laughs> at least. The yeah, they're, yeah, they're. Exactly. They're pretending like they dug up these details from their investigative reporting. And really, it's like the frickin same call sheet and all the videos from all we call them the shills. They're all the same. The talking points are the same. The visuals are the same. And it's like, this isn't even your work, dude. You're repasting something from CGTN or like Chinese state run media. Just get out GTFO. Tell me about this bank protest, because this was just the most obvious glaring abuse of the QR code system for completely not legit reasons. I mean, it go, it's, this actually happened a ton of times throughout the country, but the bank protest is a good catalyst. So the uh, in Henan, some people were protesting because the banks were basically scamming them out of their money, for lack of better words. And so naturally in China, there are a lot of protests in China, as long as they're not against the government. Um, there's protests against, like, let's say your building management is failing, or let's say uh, there there's a thing that's happening with Japan. So you're allowed to protest against Japan and the government even stokes some of those things. And it gives this impression that, Hey, yeah, protests are allowed in China, but there's never really protests against any sort of government body, right? We can go back to the same thread. China doesn't want people protesting against the government. So this Hunan bank protest thing happened. People started protesting the bank, but also protesting the local government for not doing anything about the banks, right? For not like getting their money, forcing the banks to give them their money. So when the people protested, the government, use the QR code to change everyone to red to disperse the protests, right? So this is another control mechanism. They've done this multiple times. 
when everyone's QR code goes to red, a lot of people are going to disperse and then they actually have legal kind of on the on, on the face legal ways to to move people to quarantine camps and stop those protests. Crazy, right? So basically they'll just say, "Oh, look, everyone around you is infected. You better go in." And, and it's again completely just for control. Like, we don't really want you protesting this. So what we're going to say is that you've been infected or that you are going to be infected. Now you can't go in domestic you can't go in transit, you can't go in restaurants. You literally just have to go home and if the I I would assume if the police catch you outside and you have a red QR code, you get arrested. Yes. Or something. Yes, yes. It's not necessarily criminal. It's more like you go to, uh, you know, you go to your quarantine camp. You go into that, uh, you know, those capsules, those basically, you know, uh, 18-wheeler capsules that they've repurposed for locking people up. Um, and you, a huge chunk of the economy is actually running off of COVID testing and these kind of quarantine facilities now. I wondered about uh, that. Yeah. yeah. Which is crazy because they're trying overnight, trying to implement a lot of changes um, in China to reduce some of the restrictions uh, for the COVID policies. But they've built a huge chunk of their economy around this. And they've also, I think you brought up a really good point when you said there was this unspoken rule that if you let people make money or you let people have their business, they're going to have no reason to protest because, yeah, we can be an authoritarian country and, yeah, you're not allowed to say or do what you want, but... You got money, which means it's better than Mao's time. It's better mm -hmm. than the Great Leap Forward slash Cultural Revolution. It's not that bad. And if people have that recent memory in their mind about how life was so poor and terrible, then making money just makes everything better. And that's how China's kind of allowed to uh, their citizens to keep going. It's like, okay, yeah, as long as every year you get a little bit richer than you were last year, then everything's going to be fine. Nobody's going to actually have a problem. And that's by and large been the case. Um not to say that people didn't have massive transgressions with the government, but by and large, as a general huge populace, people have been okay to do that. And for the first time we're seeing under the current regime, and that's just not the, that's just not the case. The economy is basically, just imagine a plane just nose diving into the ground right now. Because what the Xi Jinping regime has done is completely forgotten why China's gotten to, to where it's been now. They, they've completely lost the plot. Western investment, foreign investment, foreign companies experimenting with capitalism, opening up its economy to the rest of the world is why China is where it is today. It's the, the fact that it was allowed to earn money and they allowed their people to earn money is, where it is, is why China is where it is today. It's why it has global influence. And now to say, delude, I think it's a delusion, but I think that a lot of the, the top leadership and Xi Jinping has surrounded himself with so many yes men that it's gotten into a lot of people's heads that the only reason China's wealthy is actually because of the Chinese government. Right. It's this actually the because of trap, government though. policy. Yes, this dictator is always trap. the dictator trap. They're yep. surrounded, they get rid of people who tell them things they don't want to hear, and, they, and people are afraid to tell them the truth from the ground up. So even if you have, let's say you have a couple good advisor, adv advisors around you who you say, look, really, I need to hear the truth from you, the people below them aren't going to tell them the truth or the people below them aren't going to tell them the truth. So if you think, look, we have enough, let's say PPE, right? Masks and ventilators or something or vaccinate vaccines. Yeah, vaccines are good. The program's going great. Well, how do you know that? Because the people under you lied and the people under him lied and the people under him lied and the local officials were afraid to tell the guys. So there's 17 levels of people kind of bullshitting or kind yes. of fudging or being afraid. And you have to make sure that there's no fudging and that there's accurate checks and balances in all those people and, and none of that is in place. So even if you're surrounded by great advisors, are those people surrounded by officials that can tell them the truth? And are those mid-level people also working above a bunch of other people that can tell them the truth? Because if there's a little bit of corruption at every level or even a lot, which there is, you really have no idea what your vaccination rate is or what your PP, where the PPE is stored. And I think that's kind of what Russia's dealing with right now. You know, it's not necessarily that Putin is this crazy, irrational guy. It's that he probably thinks he does have working tanks. He probably thinks he does have a bunch of missiles left because nobody's going to go, ooh, yeah, you know what? We sold those. But we had a hell of a vacation in Monaco afterwards. But yeah, the, and if those people would have told them the truth, well, would the commanders and the generals and the officers below them tell them the truth? No, absolutely not. So you end up with the same thing in China. Nobody knows what's going on at the top because nobody wants to get, no, nobody's, the, the shooting of the messenger is a thing. Especially it is a real in dictatorships. thing. 
the uh, you know China had a semblance of checks and balances, nowhere near a, a like a liberal democracy, but a semblance of checks and balances because there were different power cliques within the party. There was uh -huh, different okay. gangs within the party that would keep each other in check and kind of come together and say, well, next next term we're going to appoint someone that represents this and this and this principle, right? And because Xi Jinping got rid of all opposition, all those cliques, all those people that held different ideals, maybe one guy was more like, I think we should have more communist principles that actually have social programs for people in the countryside. Then another guy says, oh, we should definitely focus more on the coastal regions because that's the economic driver of the country. They can come together and be like, yeah, we hate each other and we don't, we're not in the same clique and we're actually diametrically opposed to each other and we're, we're actually trying to like depose each other. But there's so many people involved that it creates this bizarre, almost pseudo-functional system within China yeah, like that Congress. has been eradicated. They're shooting yeah. each other in the foot, but they both, they have to play the game. Yes. So stuff actually ends up getting balanced at some level in a weird way. At some level, in a weird way, right? And it's, no, again, nowhere near a liberal democracy. Uh, but it kind of works. It keeps China go, from going into chaos. And now we're looking at China where it's tanking its own economy thinking that it's the, the government's the only reason that it got to where it is. And the people are not getting that unspoken rule. They're not getting the returns on anything. They're, they're watching their money dry up and they're watching more restriction come in, in return, getting nothing for it. So again, huge catalyst for the protests. So we've all been getting these, well, an absolute ton actually of these wrong number scam texts. And at first, I was confused, you know, I just thought, it, well, obviously the first time I thought it was an actual wrong number, but after the third in a given week, after getting these once every six months, maybe before that, I'm like, okay, something is going on here. And they say something like, hi, Cheryl, can you take my dog to the vet on Tuesday? Or, hey, Mike, good to meet you last week. Let's get together again soon. Are you coming to my party on Friday? And then it just became too obvious that something was going on here. And I wanted to do kind of a, a PSA episode to keep people safe from this scam and maybe give people something to listen to if they're being targeted by these folks. Give people something to use as ammo if one of their friends and family is getting wrapped up in this this scam, which is called the pig butchering scam or the Sha Ju Pan. Uh, you wrote one of these out for a while. You know, I did it in preparation for the interview, but I know you've done this a few times. Tell us a little bit about how these work. Well, primarily the victims of the Shaju Pan scam are Chinese people themselves. Okay, and it's been a very successful scam in China. They've made billions of dollars out of this scam, scamming people. And it really comes from this whole idea of slaughtering the pig. So you raise a pig from a young piglet all the way up until it gets to a big fat slaughtering, you know, age, and then you slaughter it. And that's where the scam name comes from. Because this kind of scam, it's kind of a long game. They start out small, make friends, <clears throat> raise you, so to speak, by constantly uh, in involving themselves in your life, getting you to trust them, and then they start to uh, in interest you in investing in cryptocurrency. Mostly it's cryptocurrency that they do, but there are other ways that they do it too. And get you to a point where you're so happy and so trusting that you're willing to drop a lot of money on this scam. And once they've received that huge amount of money from you, they then, uh, you know, slaughter you, so to speak, and take all your money and run. Now, this was so successful in China that the, the authorities actually started to crack down on it in a big way. And not only did the authorities start to crack down on it, but it became very common knowledge, okay, uh, to the point where people just weren't falling for this scam anymore because they'd heard about it. So then they started to target uh, the Chinese diaspora abroad. And China has this very interesting kind of a uh, situation um, when it comes to scammers. Uh, and I guess we can really trace this back to the whole century of humiliation that China constantly goes on about suffering, you know, at the hands of uh, foreign powers like the British in the Opium Wars and so on and so forth. It's almost accepted within China, in fact, it is accepted, to scam and take advantage of foreigners. But if you start really scam local Chinese people, that's when you get into trouble. But if you scam foreigners, you don't get into trouble. Now, this is relevant because they set up these scam call centers in Cambodia and Laos and, uh, you know, neighboring countries. And the reason they do this is because the internet is not blocked in those countries and it makes them much, it's much easier for them to then go and uh, scam 
people uh-huh. abroad using, you know, WhatsApp and Line WhatsApp, yeah. and all these other programs, not just WeChat. And of course, it's harder for them to get caught by the Chinese authorities. But they were scamming the local people in China so much that the authorities started to crack down and actually send task, task forces over to uh, capture the people in these different countries. Or they would threaten their families locally and tell them, if you don't stop scamming and if you don't come back to get arrested, then you know your families are going to go to jail and so on and so forth. So they, they changed their tactics to no longer target local Chinese people as much and start to target people abroad. Now... In the beginning, they would target the Chinese diaspora because it's, uh, you know, Chinese speaking and the, the majority of the scammers were Chinese speaking. And you may have received voice messages or phone calls where you hear a recorded voice in Chinese. Oh, yeah. This was this scam kind of evolving to target the Chinese diaspora. And my wife, actually, you know, Chinese uh, living here in the States with me, she got targeted by one of these guys as well. And. There's another very interesting twist to all of this. I'm getting ahead of myself here, but we're quite used to being targeted by uh, female, good-looking Asian women is usually the yeah. target men abroad. But in China, it's actually the opposite. It's usually handsome men targeting women. It's it's a different hmm. di- uh, it's a different thing. So um, anyway, sorry, they, they started to target the diaspora abroad, but then, of course, they targeted the diaspora a little bit too much. People got, you know, in the know, so it wasn't working as well. And of course, they can get into trouble if they're targeting Chinese citizens. So they started to move on to foreigners because if they scam foreigners, they're completely safe. There will be no repercussions at all from the Chinese government if they target foreign nationals because the Chinese government, in fact, in a way, encourages this behavior because of the rhetoric, the constant nationalist, xenophobic rhetoric that's going on right now in China. And I've experienced it firsthand in China through various scams. And being able to speak Chinese, I would be there uh, trying to buy something in a shop, in a market, and they try to overcharge, like really overcharge me. And uh, I remember right in the beginning when I was in China, I was trying to buy just a hat from a, a vendor. And the guy tried to charge me 10 times the price of what it normally is. And I heard another Chinese person come into the shop and he offered the price of 10 times less because I could understand Chinese at that point enough to understand. So um, my girlfriend came in and I told him, well, I told her to uh, ask the guy, why is he trying to charge me so much? So she started to argue on my behalf and he said to her, and this is kind of important, he said to her, why are you helping this foreigner? We Chinese need to help each other and stick together, you know, against the foreigners. Mm. So this, this is a mentality. And right. I'm explaining this because it's important. There are no repercussions when you scam foreigners. So that's why it's safe for these scammers to um, scam foreigners. And that's why they've gone to this, uh, these great lengths of getting people who can speak English, hiring people and real people. It's not just some guy sitting there on a keyboard. They'll get young, pretty girls and they'll get, you know, women and and uh, normal people that can speak English to actually, you know, start these scams and they pay them, of course. They're like paid actors working for the scammers. So that's why you're starting to see an uptick in this stuff. Yeah, for me, it's always been an Asian woman, not always Chinese in the photos, but definitely Chinese. And I know you mentioned this in your video as well. So they'll inevitably send photos, usually, well, always, actually, without me even asking, because I don't care. I'm not trying to get a photo of you holding your dog. You know, I'll say, good luck finding the dog. But before I knew it was an obvious scam, I'd say something like, hey, wrong number, but good luck finding your dog. And then minutes later or an hour later, I get a photo of some cute Korean girl or maybe Chinese using a gazillion Instagram filter or app filters holding a dog. Or they're like, just going to work out. Hope your day is going well. And I'm like, why would you text someone else that just already told you this is the wrong number? Mm -hmm. And I think they all think we're into fitness or it's maybe an easy way to show off their body because it's like midriff, tank top, you know, tights, whatever. And they're trying to get the guys hooked. And then they'll be like, I live in New York. You should come to one of my dinner parties. And I'm like, oh, cool. I don't live in New York, but whatever information you obviously have in front of you says that I do because I used to. So I'm like, ah, now I know who leaked my number <laughs> or, or, or whatever. And at first I thought this was 
Chinese Communist Party intelligence officers trying to honey trap me because that has happened before. I don't know. Is that something that you are that you are comfortable discussing or able to discuss sure. on this the honey trap? Because I know that maybe you have some. Maybe this is something you have experience with. Oh yeah, well. no, that's actually happened to me uh, in the past. I have a video about being honey trapped and how they attempted to honey trap me by. Uh, wanting to interview me um, and oh yeah come and come and uh, to this hotel here's my hotel room come to uh, we'll have an interview in my hotel room and then sending pictures um, you know of a very scantily clad uh, attractive woman showing her bra and so on and be like come let's have an interview type thing obviously a setup in order to try and uh, do something to me um, and either blackmail me or or try to beat me up or you know, kidnap me or who knows what they're trying to do, but yeah. it was definitely a honey trap thing. That's happened a lot. But, you know, uh, when it comes to these scams, they do use pretty women, the pictures of pretty women, of course, just to thirst trap men. That's the whole point of this thing. It's kind of easy. You know, men tend to switch off a lot of the defense mechanisms when there's a pretty girl around. You know, you, you tend to start to kind of relax your, I, I don't just relax and um, maybe you become a lot more gullible. <laughs> so yeah, I think so. Yeah, it but, turns off critical thinking because you might actually, you have a 1% chance that this is real. So you're like, ah, I'm going to yeah. lean into this one because guys are, we think with our, you know what, some, yeah. sometimes. Oh, men, men are stupid when it comes to women. That's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting <laughs> how that uh, it switched around. Like I said, it's usually men that target Chinese women and they build up a big, long relationship. And like I said, the one with my my wife, I, I actually encouraged her to lead the guy on a little bit. And he used to send her long voice messages because it wasn't just text, you know. Um, in the beginning here, targeting foreigners, it's usually just text because they can't speak English. So they use translation software or whatever the case. But they've gotten to a point now where they're hiring people that can speak English. But anyway, um, with the Chinese side of things, they'll get this guy to talk and say how much um, he feels like uh, she's so kind and, and such a, a nice person and, you know, like, they really could be friends and all this kind of stuff. Long, long, long. You can see where it was going. So we played this thing along for quite a while. And I'd listen to the messages as well. And the the tricky tactics that they use, they've, they're very good at being able to take advantage of, say, a lonely uh, uh, woman, sending them like uh, all these complimentary messages. And uh, it even gets to a point where they might send little gifts and things like that. If they're in China, you see, they'll buy something on Taobao oh, wow. and send it through and do this kind of thing. And it, it builds up and it builds up to the point where they get them to invest uh, a huge amount of money. And then they take it, of course, and leave it. But yes, when they moved into the Western sphere, they realized that the tactic that works the best is to just steal photos, usually from WeChat groups, because People are getting wiser and wiser. They'll, if they see a photo and they're a little bit suspicious, they might do a reverse image image search on Google to try and see if that photo is like a stock photo or a model's photo or something, right? And so, in order to avoid that, they go to uh, their WeChat friends groups because you know, in WeChat, it's kind of like Twitter or Facebook together, and you have a moments uh, section where people post their everyday life. So, oh, here I'm eating so my. Th my, yeah, my this lunch. is a Chinese app that's like Facebook plus Twitter plus PayPal plus TikTok, probably all in one. I don't oh, it's, know. It's everything. You, you pay your gas yeah. bill through that app. You buy tickets. You, you know, you do everything. You, it's like a like a banking app too. It's everything mm -hmm. all in one. But it's got the section of it called Moments. And if you scroll through your Moments posts, if you've added somebody as a friend somewhere down the line, you'll see everything they post. And of course. In today's sort of narcissistic social media type setup, you will see everything. People posting their their breakfast and their lunch and their, oh, I went to the gym or whatever. So you get all these pictures. So they grab them off of there because you can't find those on a reverse image search because it's a closed you know, system. The Chinese WeChat and, and the intranet is kind of closed off. Those, those photos don't go anywhere else. So they'll steal from somebody or in my case, I did that thing uh, where I um, I scammed the scammer, so to speak, the, the scammer named Salad. That's what she called herself, <laughs> which is right. kind of ridiculous. But anyway, um, I found out that the pictures they were using were actually from um, an Instagram model, okay? And huh. uh, in fact, I got contacted by a lawyer asking me to please take down the pictures because the Instagram model's life was being affected by my video. So, of course, I did. I didn't realize that it was a, a real Instagram model. Right. So. I blurred her out. But the fact of the matter is they go and they find these photos and they'll start to try and entice you with little bits here and there um, in order to try and build a bond. 
But the interesting thing, like I said, is that they're starting to use people that can speak English. So they sometimes send voice messages as well, which really just ups the game, so to speak, because you can use translation software all you want. But when you start to speak to someone and when you start to send little video clips and things like that, it really makes it more believable. 